Hi class, I'm making this series of videos. There's going to be two different videos where we talk about unit three and then get ready to write the essay. Um, I'm making these video videos because it seems like some of you are a little bit confused about what's going on in this unit. So I hope that taken together, they're going to help you get ready and write the very best essay you can for this unit. So the first thing you need to know is that for this unit, you're going to pick one of the two articles that we've read and write a reader response to them. In this video, I'm going to talk just about the two articles that we've read and go over those articles just to make sure everybody is understanding both the rhetorical situation and the author's main ideas in the articles. So let's get started and go talk about those articles. First article that we read is A Better Kind of Happiness by Will Storr. All right, so these are the questions that I asked you in your organizer sheet um, for each of the articles. So I wanted to go over kind of the answers to this and talk a little bit more about rhetorical situation because this is one of the things you're going to be able to be critical of when you write your response. Okay, so this article was about happiness, right? And specifically happiness related to um, kind of human health or the human genome. The author is Will Storr. When I ask you about the author, I don't want you to just list the author's name. Right? I can just look at the piece of paper and see that. I want you to go deeper than that. I want you to think about who Will Storr is and if he's somebody who you would believe. All right. In this case, I Googled him. I found out he is an award-winning British author. He's written books. He is um, kind of known to talk about happiness. And so he would be someone I would believe to talk about in this topic. If for some reason Will Storr, um, I felt like, wasn't qualified, that would be something I could write about in my response, right? So I need to understand who he is in order to see if that's going to make the article good or bad, right? So, so far I'm like, okay, Will Storr, like him, believe that he could write this article, not so critical of that. All right, the other thing I want you to think about is who the audience is. When I ask you who the audience is, I don't want you to just guess who the audience is. I don't want you to think about these are the people who should be reading this article. Um, and I definitely don't want you to say this article is for everyone. All right. First of all, this article is written in English. And so that excludes anyone who cannot read English. Um, and so then it is definitely not for anyone. When you think about the audience, you want to think about where this article appeared. Any writer, yourself included, needs to write with an audience in mind, thinking about who would, what people am I trying to convince about this topic that I want them to know about. All right, and so if you work for a publication, then you're right into the audience of the people who read that publication. Okay, so if we're, this article is published in the New Yorker. I'm gonna guess that a lot of people, traditional college age, are not the readers of the New Yorker. Um, and so I Googled and I found a website that talked about the audience of the New Yorker being middle-class people with upper-class aspirations. And I know a little bit about the New Yorker and I thought that was pretty spot on, right? Um, so the New, York, New Yorker is a weekly publication. Um, it really is written for people who are kind of aspiring to be something, right? They, New Yorker is unique in that it um, has a uh, part where it publishes short stories and poetry. It ha is famous for its political cartoons. Um, and so it is really meant for people who they want to someday be, you know, artists, they want to be scientists, they want to be um, the, the kind of movers and shakers in the world, but maybe they're not quite yet. And again, it's called The New Yorker. It is probably geared more towards um, people who live in New York. I like to think it's something that, you know, like a starving artist reads The New Yorker because it makes them feel like they've made it already. Okay, the purpose, why does the author write? There's three main purposes that you can talk about. The first purpose is to inform, second one is to persuade, and the third is just to entertain. When we're talking about just entertaining, then usually that's like a novel or a piece of fiction. Um, most of the things we're, you're gonna read in school are either gonna be to inform or persuade. So in this case, I think Will Storr is pretty much just trying to inform us about the idea of happiness um, and where it comes from and how it is reflected in the genome. When I talk about organization, moving on, um, most of you have been putting for organization the name of the publication. 
Um, I know I had this in a video before, but I think a lot of you missed it. So when I talk about organization, I'm talking about how is this essay organized? Common types of organization will be things like um, cause and effect, problem solution, compare, contrast, um, or in this one, straight up just providing evidence for your thesis, right? Just making a regular old argument with a evidence for your thesis statement. So this is our um, organized, I would say, just in presenting evidence to support the point. The author's main point for this article is that science has found that it is possible to see happiness in your genes, and this is helping us to think about what the true meaning of happiness is. Okay, moving on. The organizer broke this article down into four parts. Um, in this one, it is kind of the four parts involved talking about the Aristotle and then three different scientific studies. So for the first part, the author starts by talking about the ancient Greeks and how since way back then, it has been an argument about the meaning of happiness. Some see it as hedonistic, um, you know, kind of instant gratification, instant pleasure, like eating something you love, um, sharing a kiss, get buying something that you've been wanting. That immediate gratification is one example of happiness. Other people found that it's, you know, striving for kind of that afterlife and being accepted into heaven. Um, and then there is Aristotle, who proposed the idea of eudaimonic happiness. Um, so that involves living with a perfect purpose. This section ends, the first paragraph ends with what I think is a thesis statement, which is that today there's evidence that links having a person purpose in life to the human genome, and that's been discovered by scientists. Then the article goes on to show you how it's been seen by scientists. So paragraph two talks about a study by John Cassipio and Steve Cole, and they talked about loneliness, and they found that how it can be seen in the human genome and was related to increased inflammation and lowered immunity. In paragraphs three through five, it talks about how Steve Cole went and talked to Barbara Fredrickson, and they decided to do an experiment where they looked for the opposite of the first experiment. They decided to see how happiness in could affect the human genome. Um, Fredrickson thought they would see an impact through hedonistic happiness. Cole didn't think there would be any kind of effect on the genome. They were both wrong. Um, they found that specifically eudaimonic happiness or having a purpose in life did have a positive effect on the genome that meant less inflammation for people and more immunity from illnesses. Finally, in the end, they talk about a study done by Brian Little from Cambridge. He looked at people's personal projects and found that people who had core projects also um, had a more fulfilling life. Um, so like the other scientists, Little found that the nature of the product projects can vary, but the end result is that having something meaningful in your life is a key to happiness, right? So they all kind of said that it's this eudaimonic happiness or having a meaning or purpose in your life which will have the biggest impact, but that whatever it is that gives you meaning and purpose can vary from person to person. All right, moving on to the next article. There's more to life than being happiness, than being happy by Emily F. Svani Smith. Um, the topic of this is meaningfulness versus happiness. Emily F. Svani Smith Googled her. She is a writer. She's an editor. She is a speaker and she actually wrote a book on happiness. So she's super qualified to talk about happiness in this article. For her audience, she's writing for a magazine called The Atlantic. And I put the audience here as movers and shakers. That's kind of my shorthand for saying um, an influential audience, um, probably older people who are um, have more money, have more free time, have time to read The Atlantic magazine that she's trying to persuade the readers that they should build a life centered around meaning rather than happiness. Okay, so she's being more persuasive. And the organization pattern she, she uses is compare and contrast. Oh, I just realized I didn't have the topic sentence kind of for this one. I think her thesis statement is about um, how people should lead a life of meaning versus happiness. Okay, so she starts her article with this Viktor Frankl's story. Um, through his experience in the concentration camps, um, Viktor Frankl, who was a psychiatrist, psychiatrist, um, he learned more, that was more important to have meaning than happiness, right? Um, we'll 
tell the rest of his tale at the end. But we'll just leave it at that right now. But he was in the concentration camp, a psychiatrist. Um, he got out and he wrote a book and talking about how the key to happiness in life is to find meaning. Um, then it goes on to talk about studies that show this, right? So there's been studies that show that leading a meaningful life can enhance our mood, health, and sense of well-being, and also is associated with being a giver, whereas these studies found that happiness is associated with selfishness and being a taker. Um, and ironically, they said, if you search for happiness, it's only going to lead you to be more unhappy. Then in the next paragraph, they talk about a study by Baumeister. He talks about how the search for meaning is what sets humans apart from animals. That even animals also look for kind of that hedonistic kind of happiness, the instant gratification, the instant pleasure of being the squirrel who finds that nut. Um, but humans are search for meaning, and that's what sets us apart. So he did a study, and he found that meaning was obtained mostly through self-sacrifice and helping others. He found that while happiness is fleeting, meaning is what lasts. So even when you have negative experience, that contributes to meaning in your life, um, and that's what lasts. Finally, Frank, or not Frankel, uh, Smith ends her article going back to Frankel and telling the rest of his tale, right, about how he could have possibly escaped the concentration camp and never been sent to them, but he chose to stay and support his parents. Of course, that didn't work out so well um, for his family, right? His parents and his pregnant wife were killed in the concentration camp. So you would think that would pretty much destroy Frankel. But because Frankel's perspective is um, meaning is more important than happiness, he realized that he had this greater purpose in life still, despite his tragedy. Um, so he wrote about for the rest of his life and talked about um, it's more important to lead a meaningful life, to choose meaning over happiness. Okay, so that's a little bit about the two articles. I'll stop here, and then in the next video, I'll talk to you about how to write the essay.